All right, today in this video, I'm going to be talking about OSPF in the exchange start state. I'm going to explain exactly what happens. Uh, as I'm going through my CCIE book, I stumbled across this table about the OSPF neighbor states, and I know about them, about the init, the two-way state, the exchange start, all that stuff. But then when you go into actually what's happening in the, in the exchange start state, I was like, how does this really work? So in the CCI book, you know, the exchange start state says currently negotiating the um, database descriptor sequence numbers and then uses a master slave logic for DD packets. So I'm like, okay, um, the CCMP, CCNA books, they really don't go deep into that. And how does this master slave logic actually work? And as I did some packet captures, did some tests, I thought it was very interesting. And there's not many videos out there that explain it. So this is what this video is all about. So how this actually works, there's three important flags that happen in the exchange start state. There's the init flag, the more flag, mass, and the master flag. And then the whole master slave logic, who is determined to be the master, who is going to be the slave. Well, basically... The router, when two neighbors create a relationship, so I'm going to create a relationship between R1 and R2, the one with the highest router ID, according to OSPF, that will be the master. And what does that mean? That means that the master is the one who speaks and always expects a response. So when they exchange their database descriptor packets, the master is going to say, here you go, here's some DD packets, I need you to respond. Now the slave cannot speak unless spoken to. So every time the master sends a DD packet, the slave needs to respond also with a DD packet. And this goes on when they exchange all the LSA headers in their database. But what happens if the master runs out of LSA headers and doesn't really need to send um, a, a DBD or a DD packet to R2, and R2 has a huge uh, bigger database than R1. Well, this is where the slave is going to, every time he responds and he needs to tell the master that he needs to speak again, he'll set the more flag to on, which is the one bit, or two way one, to flip that bit. So if the slave needs to speak some more, he'll set the more bit, the more flag, and then the master will then pull or ask the slave, okay, what else do you need to tell me? So that's kind of like how this whole master-slave logic works. So let's actually get into it. Everything is set up. All I need to do is just do a no-shut on R1. So let me start Wireshark right now. Actually, I just did a capture, but that was for testing purposes. So let me start it up real quick. And let me get my filters going on too. I don't want that. Let me clean this up just so we only see OSPF packets. Not selected. And not selected. No ARPs. All right. I think we got some going on here. Yep. Yeah. So we got some OSPF packets going on. So let me do a no shut on this. Actually, it should be shut down. Yeah, I shut it down. So let's do a no shut. That should come up. Okay. Now we should see some packets going on. There we go. All right. So we went through the whole process, but I want to only look at these DVDs real quick. Okay. So the first database descriptor, it was sent from R1 to R2. And if we open it up, you can see the OSPF headers. And then we actually go into the meat of this packet, the OSPF DBD. And there are some things that we need to look at. So let me squish this first. And in this DBD packet, all three flags are set at first. When we first create our two-way state and we move into the exchange start state this is where we are going to choose who is going to be the master and who is going to be the slave so the first DVD packet that was sent was sent from R1 
with the 12.12.12.1. And his router ID is 100.1.1.1. And his first sequence number for this DVD is 4897. And you see that all three of these flags are set. The init, the more, and the master. So he's claiming... This is my first packet. Here's my sequence number. I am the master. I need to start giving you my LSA headers. Now, the second DVD packet that came in was from R2. His router ID is 2.2.2.2. This is his first initial um, DVD packet that he sent. He needs to tell more, and he thinks he's the master, and there is his random sequence number that he generated. Now, he received the first DVD packet from R1. Notice the next DVD packet in succession is still from R2. So based on that whole master speaks and needs a response, he received it the first time. He still needs to send out his to make sure that the other side knows that R1 is going to be the master. So he immediately responds to the master's um, message, uh, his, his, mes his init message. And then you can see here that he stopped saying that he was the master. He lined up his DVD packet with R1 sequence number because R1 sequence number should be 4897, and it is. So he's like, we're going to start on 4897. So he's like, okay, here we go. And then actually... Here are all the LSAs that he was talking about. So let me bring this up real quick. Here are the LSAs that he knows about. He knows about one, two, three, four, four LSAs. Uh, four. He has four LSA headers. So that's what he's trying to do. He's telling him about it. And then notice he has the more flag set. So now that is telling the master, hey, the slave needs to speak again, so I need you to send me another message. So then R1 sends his LSAs to R2. He says he's the master. He needs to tell him some more. And if I bring this up, more LSAs. All right, so they're exchanging the database now. So now that he pulled, uh, he, he sent a message to R2. R2 needs to respond. R2 responds and says, okay, here's the next sequence number. We're still in sync, and I'm not the master. I do not need to tell you anything more. Now, R1 will send a DVD packet, and he does not have the more flag set. He still says he's a master, and here's the sequence number that we're on. This should initiate that R1 is done speaking. Now, if R2 is done speaking, he has to respond to what R1 just said, and this is the last DVD packet. And then R2 says, okay, we're good. Um, we're still on the sequence number. I don't need to tell you anything more. You don't need to tell me anything more. We can now move on to the exchange state. This is where we start seeing the LS request messages and the updates. And then eventually we get to the acknowledgments. So uh, then we're all f good and happy, and we satisfied all of these uh, OSPF neighbor states. So the exchange start state, it's a very logical negotiation and exchanging of packets, and they do it in a specific way, and then they tell each other, I don't need to send anymore. Uh, are you sure you don't need to send any more? All that stuff. And it all has to do with those flags. And um, that's basically it. So every time the master speaks, whoever it is, the one with the highest router ID, it expects the slave to respond. And if the slave needs to talk before he just starts speaking, he needs to tell the master, hey, ask me a question, at, tell, send me a packet so then I could respond because I have more LSA headers than you, then that's what we have to do. We have to set the more flag. Okay? So I hope this gave you a better understanding of the exchange start state. And if you ever start reading 
uh, the OSPF states and you go across the whole master-slave logic. Uh, I hope this uh, explained it well. Uh, there weren't many videos on YouTube on this, so this is the reason why I wanted to do this because I actually wanted to see it in action rather than just reading it, you know, online. So, okay, that's it. I hope that was informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.